In recent years, the landscape of religious freedom has been shifting in unsettling ways. The trend is alarming. If Christians do not begin to speak and act, we are approaching a time when it will be illegal to preach the gospel. This is not a distant dystopian future, but a very real possibility that could unfold within our lifetimes. The idea that pastors might face jail time for standing up on the pulpit to preach from the Bible seems unthinkable, yet it is a scenario that is inching closer to reality. There was once a time when every classroom across this nation had a Bible. There was once a time when children up and down our nation would pray before lessons. However, systematically over the decades, God has been removed more and more from our society and we are moving towards a time when preaching the gospel, reading the Bible, or quoting scripture will be outlawed. A lot of people have forgotten this fact. Across this nation, Bibles and prayer were a very part of our society, but one godless woman had prayer and Bibles removed from school. Madeleine Murray O'Hare in 1963 played a pivotal role in the removal of Bible readings and prayer from American public schools. A godless woman. One godless woman managed to accomplish this. There is a sentiment among some Christians that we should completely stay out of politics, focusing solely on spiritual matters. However, this perspective is dangerously short-sighted. Our faith does not exist in a vacuum, separate from the world around us. The manner in which we are governed directly impacts our ability to live out and share our beliefs. What if we end up living in a nation that does not allow us to congregate to praise our Lord Jesus Christ? What if we end up living in a nation that does not allow your pastor to preach from the Bible on the grounds that the Bible offends some people? What if we end up living in a nation that censors biblical content online, preventing us from spreading the message of Jesus Christ through social media and websites? What if we end up living in a nation that enforces laws against religious counseling, making it illegal for pastors and Christian counselors to provide guidance based on biblical principles? What if we end up living in a nation that prosecutes individuals for practicing their faith openly, leading to a society where Christians must hide their beliefs to avoid legal consequences? We are already seeing signs clear signs that we are heading in that direction. The increasing encroachment on religious expression is evident in various parts of the world, and the Western nations, once bastions of religious liberty, are not immune. There have been numerous instances where quoting the Bible or expressing traditional Christian beliefs has been labelled as hate speech. This trajectory suggests a future where even reading a Bible verse or passages of Scripture publicly could be considered a criminal act. Consider the implications. A pastor standing at the pulpit, delivering a sermon that includes a verse from Leviticus or Romans, could be accused of hate speech if the passage is perceived as offensive by modern societal standards. The Bible's teachings on marriage, sexuality and moral conduct are increasingly at odds with the prevailing cultural norms. As society moves further away from these biblical principles, the gap between what is legal and what is scriptural continues to widen. We are living in perilous times, with more and more people becoming immoral. This nation is becoming a more immoral country, a slothful country, an irreverent country. Let's look at each of these issues in our nation. An immoral country, where is our sense of morality anymore? Where is our sense of right and wrong? Promiscuity is praised and rewarded. Living a lifestyle of bed hopping or showing indecent images of yourself on the internet is financially rewarded. We are living in an age where people are literally becoming millionaires from showing unholy images and videos of themselves. I am not exaggerating. They are becoming millionaires, receiving life-changing money from immoral behavior. We are living in an age where immorality pays. Immorality is at an all-time high, it is growing, it is glorified. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? In addition, we now live in a country where you can order immorality to your door. With the rise of technology, 
immorality is just two clicks away. The ease of access to explicit content and the normalization of such behavior reflect a deep moral decay. Services that cater to illicit desires can be accessed effortlessly, further entrenching the culture of sin and debauchery. The omnipresence of immorality in our daily lives, facilitated by technology, underscores a profound erosion of values. This societal shift challenges us to reflect on our moral compass and seek ways to restore a sense of decency and virtue in our communities. The prevalence of such behavior is a stark reminder of the need to reassert the importance of moral integrity and spiritual guidance. The Bible keeps a man from sin. The Bible keeps a man from immorality. Our nation has become increasingly slothful and the statistics paint a concerning picture. A significant portion of the population is not engaged in work. While many people earnestly seek employment and face genuine obstacles, there is also a troubling number who are simply slothful and have no desire to work. These individuals live their lives with their hands out, expecting others to support them for no other reason than their own laziness. In the United States, numerous support programs provide financial assistance to those in need, including unemployment benefits, food stamps, and housing aid. While these programs are essential for those who are genuinely struggling, they are also exploited by those who prefer to live off handouts rather than earn their income. This dependence on social welfare, when not genuinely needed, perpetuates a cycle of laziness and entitlement. Slothfulness and laziness are sins, and as believers, we must recognize this. The Bible describes laziness as wickedness, Yet why are we, as Christians, so quick to point out sexual immorality, fornication, heresy, and other sins, but rarely address the sin of laziness? Laziness is a sin, and the Bible is unequivocal on this matter. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it is written, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith, and is worse than an unbeliever. This verse underscores the importance of diligence and responsibility. As Christians, we must confront the sin of laziness with the same urgency as other sins. We need to encourage a strong work ethic, self-discipline, and personal responsibility in our families and in our nation. Laziness is a sin. Slotfulness is a sin. But I hesitate to ask, when is the last time you heard a sermon about laziness? We are living in a generation of people who feel entitled and unwilling to work. They want to be given their life rather than work hard for it. This entitlement mentality is pervasive, leading many to expect handouts instead of pursuing diligent labor and personal responsibility. The Bible has a great deal to say about laziness. Proverbs is especially filled with wisdom concerning laziness and warnings to the lazy person. Proverbs 13.4 states, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. This verse highlights the contrast between the lazy and the hardworking. The lazy person desires the benefits of hard work without putting in the effort, while the diligent person reaps the rewards of their labor. Laziness has no part in the Christian life. Proverbs 10.4 warns, A slack hand causes poverty but the hand of the diligent makes rich. The Bible consistently encourages diligence and condemns laziness. It teaches that hard work and responsibility are virtues that lead to prosperity and fulfillment. As Christians, we must reject the entitlement mentality and embrace a work ethic that reflects biblical values. We are living in a time when this nation has become increasingly irreverent. There is nothing sacred and holy anymore. There are no longer any lines people will not cross. There is no more fear of God or reverence for Him. This nation is becoming more and more irreverent each day. There was once a time when it was a common practice in America, as well as in many other Western countries, for people to remove their hats when passing by a church building. This gesture was a sign of respect for the sacredness of churches and church buildings. This practice of removing hats when passing by a church was tied to a broader cultural context 
where church buildings were deeply respected and public displays of reverence were more commonplace. Society in general feared God more. The local community respected the local pastor. Over time, these customs have faded and are not observed at all today, reflecting broader changes in societal norms and attitudes towards biblical and cultural traditions. It is not an exaggeration to say that the common unbelieving man walking on the street 100 years ago had more fear of the Lord than many modern-day church members do today. The erosion of reverence for the divine and the sacred has permeated all aspects of society. Places of worship, once revered as holy sanctuaries, are now often treated with casual indifference. This shift is not merely a change in social customs, but reflects a deeper spiritual falling away. In the past, public displays of respect for God and religious institutions were widespread. People had a profound sense of awe and respect for God. Today, such sentiments are rare. The sacred has been desacralized and reverence for God has diminished. This is evident in the way society treats religious symbols, practices and institutions. What was once considered holy is now often subject to mockery and disdain. I am not exaggerating when I state that this country we live in has been one of the greatest nations that has ever risen. What made this nation so great was the fear of the Lord, the reverence, honor and respect for the Lord. The Lord blessed this nation abundantly and America thrived under his blessings. However, this nation is changing. The hand of the Lord is withdrawing from America because this nation has rejected God. You are witnessing a significant transition in our country. This year is an election year and the fate of the nation hangs in the balance. You may be an old man or an old woman and your time on this earth may be short, but your children and grandchildren will have to live in the nation that you are leaving behind for them. This shift is profound, impacting every aspect of our society. Our values, once rooted in a deep respect for biblical guidance, are being replaced by secular ideologies. The moral fabric of our communities is fraying as we move away from the principles that once unified us. As citizens, we must recognize the gravity of this moment. Our decisions, especially in this election year, will determine the direction of our nation for generations to come. It's not just about political power, but about the soul of our country. Our legacy is at stake and we must consider the future we are crafting for those who come after us, for your children and grandchildren. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. In this election year, it is imperative to lift our voices in prayer for our nation. Pray fervently for the healing of this land, for the restoration of unity and righteousness. Pray that the Lord intervenes in our country's affairs, guiding the hearts and minds of our leaders and citizens alike. As we face significant challenges and pivotal decisions, our prayers can be a powerful force for positive change. We are at a critical juncture in history, if we do not stand up and take action now, we may soon find ourselves in a world where reading the Bible is illegal, where preaching the gospel is prohibited, and where living out our faith openly invites persecution. Imagine a nation where pastors are imprisoned for simply proclaiming the word of God, where Christian teachings are labeled as hate speech, and where our children are indoctrinated with values that run counter to our faith. The consequences of our inaction are dire. Our religious freedoms are not just at risk, they are under direct attack. If we remain silent, we will usher in an era where the church is silenced, where the Bible is banned, and where the gospel message is driven underground. We must not let this happen. Now is the time to stand firm, to pray earnestly, and to act courageously. Let us commit to being vigilant, to defending our faith, and to ensuring that the legacy we leave behind is one of faith, hope, and unwavering devotion to the Lord. Our future and the future of our children depend on the choices we make today. 
Imagine a world consumed by darkness, where the moral fabric of society has unraveled completely. Corruption runs rampant, and humanity seems to have lost its way. Picture a time when evil is not only tolerated, but celebrated, and every day brings new horrors that push the boundaries of wickedness further than ever before. This is not a scene from a dystopian novel or a horror movie. This was the reality in the days of Noah. As we delve into the depths of the book of Genesis, we uncover a time so drenched in depravity that it grieved the very heart of God. People lived without regard for righteousness, indulging in every conceivable sin and ignoring the impending doom that loomed over them. It was a time of unprecedented moral decay, where the line between right and wrong was all but erased. The inhabitants of this ancient world carried on with their lives, blind to the judgment that was about to befall them. They ate, they drank, they married, and they were given in marriage, living as if nothing could disrupt their corrupted way of life. They were oblivious to the warning signs, to the righteousness preached by Noah, a lone beacon of faith in an ocean of iniquity. The days turned into weeks, the weeks into years, and still they paid no attention. Then came the rain, a torrential downpour that washed away not just the filth of their deeds, but the very foundations of their existence. The floodgates of heaven opened, and the waters surged, sweeping away the unrepentant in a deluge of divine retribution. It was a cataclysmic end to a world that had forsaken God Almighty. This harrowing tale from the past serves as a stark warning for us today. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days leading up to the coming of the Son of Man. We live in times that echo those ancient days where the signs of moral decay and spiritual apathy are all around us. Luke 17, verse 26 and 27, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Imagine a world where moral corruption is so pervasive that it saturates every facet of society. Such was the world in the days of Noah, where sin was not only rampant, but celebrated. This wasn't just ordinary wrongdoing. It was sin reaching its pinnacle, with humanity spiraling toward utter destruction, beyond any hope of recovery. The Bible tells us that this pattern of moral decay will repeat itself in the end times, yet to an even greater degree. We are living in that generation, mirroring the days of Noah, where sin is loved and adored, where sin is celebrated. Throughout human history, countless evils have been committed, but God has not punished every generation for its sinful behavior. This is because God is long-suffering and merciful, not delighting in the destruction of the wicked. In His wisdom, God sometimes chooses to show mercy. Even though all people have sinned and continue to sin, only God can determine when a society or nation has reached a critical point of violating His laws, beyond which He will tolerate no more. It was in God's perfect judgment that He destroyed the world during the days of Noah, allowing it to serve as an example for all mankind. Today, we are witnessing a significant departure from faith, accompanied by a strong delusion sent upon those who reject the truth and take pleasure in unrighteousness. This is a deliberate choice, not something forced upon people. Sin and unbelief are becoming increasingly perverse and widespread, readily accepted at every level of society, from the laws enacted to the lifestyles chosen. We now have laws that allow sin and push people in the direction of sin. The fear of God has almost vanished, and moral decline is accelerating rapidly. Do you know there are websites, actual websites, that facilitate married men and married women having affairs with one another? Do you understand that? Actual websites where a married man can log on, find married women on the same website, and have an affair, only to return home to their respective spouses. The days of Noah have arrived. Just as God warned the people in Noah's day of the impending flood, He warns us today of the coming destruction by fire and His impending wrath and judgment. In an immoral society, sin is cushioned and given a soft place to fall. It is watered down and sugar-coated, no longer seen as the danger and destruction it truly is. Sin is now described as a lifestyle choice, not as sin. Sin is no longer shamed or done in darkness. It is celebrated and done openly. Look at the how God viewed the days of Noah. Genesis 6 verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, 
and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This one verse describes our generation. We live in a generation of pleasure seekers, not God seekers. A generation of sin seekers, not righteousness seekers. Sin hardens hearts and blinds eyes, creating a seared conscience in those who refuse to repent. We are living among a generation full of people with seared consciences, where sin is defended and described as a human right. This makes it difficult for them to find their way back to God or live a life of faith. Unbelief manifests in sinful decisions and lifestyles, leading to hearts that do not fear God, ultimately making it difficult to hear him when he speaks. When Jesus said, and as it was in the days of Noah, he was drawing a chilling parallel between the ancient world and our present times. In Noah's day, despite the rampant depravity and moral corruption, people carried on with their lives as if nothing was amiss. They ate, drank, married, and were given in marriage, oblivious to the impending judgment. They were entrenched in their routines, completely unaware of the doom that loomed over them. This was a society that had lost all sense of right and wrong, yet they continued their lives without a single thought of God's impending judgment. Today, we see a striking resemblance to those times. Our generation is marked by the same kind of moral decay and spiritual apathy. People are living for pleasure, indulging in sin, and ignoring the warnings of God's judgment. Individuals are creating OnlyFans accounts with no regard for God. Some people, after watching this video, will return to their favorite websites that feature immoral content and unholy videos without a care in the world. Their consciences are seared. Right now, there are those who plan to commit sexual immorality later tonight, despite knowing it is wrong. They are literally planning to go fornicate or commit adultery later today. People today are willing to lose their souls in pursuit of money. All of these individuals are aware that judgment is coming. They have been warned, but they continue living their normal lives. Their routines are centered around sin. Just like in the days of Noah, our society is engrossed in its daily activities, blind to the signs of the times. This scenario mirrors our present age. Today, people are living depraved lives, seeking pleasure without regard for God or His judgment. Society continues with its routines, blind to the signs of the times. Just as in Noah's day, people eat, drink, marry, and pursue their desires, unconcerned about the moral and spiritual decay that surrounds them. The pervasive attitude is one of indifference towards sin and disbelief in divine judgment. Despite numerous signs, people will remain largely unaware and unprepared. They will disregard, justify, or explain them away with scientific evidence and other rationalizations. They will continue living their lives, adapting to societal morals and the laws that govern them. Like sheep, people will follow the spirit of the age unless they are following the spirit of Christ. The cycles of life, summarized by eating and drinking, seed time and harvest, and marrying and giving in marriage, are the fundamental foundations of life and society, and they will continue unabated. In both eras, the complacency is striking. The people of Noah's day were warned, but they dismissed Noah's message as irrelevant. They were too engrossed in their own lives to heed the call to repentance. Similarly, today, many ignore the message of the gospel. They are too occupied with their pursuits to consider the reality of sin and its consequences. They continue in their routines, unaware or unconcerned that judgment is imminent. Jesus' comparison serves as a powerful warning. He emphasized that, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. People will be caught off guard, going about their lives without a thought for God's judgment, until it is too late. This warning is meant to jolt us out of our complacency and indifference. It is a call to wake up and recognize the seriousness of our spiritual condition. In our current age, we see the same disregard for righteousness and the same pursuit of pleasure. Sin is not only tolerated, but often celebrated. Moral standards are eroded, and what was once considered depraved is now accepted or even praised. This is a clear reflection of the days of Noah, where people were deeply sinful yet completely unconcerned about it. We must not ignore the parallels. The days of Noah were marked by a complete lack of concern for God's impending judgment, and Jesus warned that the end times would be the same. People will continue in their depravity, blind to the approaching catastrophe. The indifference and moral decay we see today are harbingers of the coming judgment. As we reflect on the world today, it is impossible to ignore the striking resemblance to the days of Noah. 
Isaiah 55 verse 6 implores us, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. This verse is a beacon of urgency, a call to immediate action. We are living in the last days, and the time to seek God is now, before it is too late. Isaiah's call to seek the Lord while he may be found is a stark reminder that time is running out. The opportunity for repentance is not infinite. Just as the door of the ark closed, sealing the fate of those outside, the time will come when it will be too late to seek God. The urgency of this message cannot be overstated. We must turn to God now, while we still have the chance. The world today is engrossed in activities that numb the spiritual senses. People are busy with their routines, eating, drinking, marrying, and engaging in various pursuits without a thought for their eternal destiny. This indifference to sin and disbelief in divine judgment is a dangerous path, leading many to destruction. We must wake up from our complacency. The moral and spiritual decay around us is a clear sign that we are living in the last days. God's patience is immense, but it is not endless. The call to seek the Lord while he may be found is not just a gentle suggestion. It is a desperate plea. We must recognize the seriousness of our spiritual condition and turn to God with all our hearts. Isaiah 55. 6 reminds us that God is near and ready to be found by those who seek Him earnestly, but this window of opportunity will not remain open forever. The signs of the times are all around us, and the parallels to the days of Noah are undeniable. We must act now, repent, and seek the Lord with urgency. The fate of our souls depends on it. As we look around at our world today, we must ask ourselves a sobering question. What are we truly seeking? Are we seeking the Lord, or are we pursuing materialism? Are we striving for the pleasures of this world, or are we dedicating ourselves to God? Are we chasing after money and success, or are we earnestly seeking a relationship with our Creator? Isaiah 55, 6 urges us, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He is near. This call to action is more relevant now than ever. In our modern society, it's easy to become consumed by the pursuit of material wealth. We are bombarded with messages that equate success with financial prosperity, urging us to chase after the latest gadgets, luxury cars, and bigger homes. But in this relentless pursuit of materialism, where does God fit into our lives? Similarly, the pursuit of pleasure can easily become an idol. We seek out entertainment, indulgence, and experiences that promise to make us feel good, often at the expense of our spiritual well-being. Whether it's through social media, streaming services, or various forms of escapism, we find ourselves distracted and distant from the true source of lasting joy and fulfillment, God. Money, too, can become a false god. While it's necessary for survival and can be used for good, the love of money can lead us astray. Jesus warned us about the dangers of serving two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. Yet how often do we find ourselves prioritizing our careers, our financial portfolios, and our earthly success over our relationship with God? As we reflect on these questions, we must consider where our hearts are truly aligned. Are we investing our time, energy, and resources in things that will pass away, or are we laying up treasures in heaven? In the days of Noah, people were consumed with their daily lives, blind to the impending judgment. They sought after their own desires, indifferent to the call of righteousness. Today, we see a similar pattern. Many are engrossed in their routines, chasing after what the world offers, while neglecting their spiritual health and eternal destiny. It's time to reevaluate our priorities. What are we seeking? Are we pursuing a deeper relationship with the Lord, or are we allowing ourselves to be seduced by the temporary and fleeting? The call to seek the Lord is urgent. We must turn our hearts towards Him, abandoning our idols of materialism, pleasure, and money. Let us seek the Lord while He may be found and call on Him while He is near. Only in Him will we find true fulfillment, peace, and eternal life. The time is now to make a choice. What are you seeking, the Lord or the empty promises of this world?